If you have a Bible, please open to John um, 14. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the chair in front of you. And John 14, where we'll be today, is on page 622, I believe. So if you go to page 622 in your Bible, you'll be where we're at. John 14, 6. We've been going through now, this is the fourth week of... Um, our series on the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. Solas means only, so we're looking at the onlys. We did Scripture alone, which we believe that the authority of the church is found in Scripture, in Scripture alone. It's sufficient for everything in our lives. And then we move to faith alone, that we are uh, found to be justified in Christ by faith alone apart from works. Last week we did grace alone, which means there is nothing on our part that we do prior to God coming in His grace. It comes to those spiritually dead that can't affect salvation in themselves in any way. That's grace alone. Now we come to Christ alone, which is um, the profound statement that there is salvation in no one else. And as we move through the text today, you'll see why this is probably the most controversial issue Uh, facing the world is who is Christ and is he exclusively the only way of salvation so I'll read John uh, 14 1 through 6 and you'll get the context of what's going on John 14 1 let not your hearts be troubled believe in God believe also in me In my father's house are many rooms If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will make and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for this day that we've been able to worship you and songs that exalt your name in Christ. And God, we uh, understand what a great privilege it is today as we see the increasing persecution around the world. Um, God, we know that um, maybe what has changed the most is that media has changed. And now we're we're made aware of what has always been occurring since the time that you've commissioned the disciples and that our brothers around the world are vastly persecuted. And we know that we live in an anomaly here. And God, we just thank you because we know it's by your grace and your mercy that we have been born here. Our church is here. We can come and worship you. We never think twice about real hard persecution. God, we understand that today we came and we worship you and even worshiping you is grace. And God, we just thank you for that privilege. God, I pray that this truth here um, would cause us to value Jesus above all else in our life this doctrine of Christ alone. And God, also, if there are people here that have never become Christians by union with you through faith, they've never come to that place where they have, as we looked at last week, been born again through your grace, that I pray, God, that you would see that they'd be confronted by the reality of this controversial words that you spoke, um, demanding exclusivity in, in the human heart. I pray, God, that you would awaken that person and save them by your grace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, while surfing the internet this past Thanksgiving, came across a a website, a blog, where people can write what they're most thankful for. And one woman drew my attention uh, because of all of the things that people were most thankful for in life. She said this, I thank God daily that I am seen righteous through my belief in Jesus. God is faithful to forgive me. I am most thankful that my Creator loved me enough to send His Son so that I might have life and have it more abundantly. I find hope and joy in the sound of His name. Now, this woman drew my attention to something that I think is absolutely crucial. We ought as Christians to be most thankful for Jesus in our lives above all else in this world. He ought to be valued more than anything else. Uh, Despite the circumstances of life, what's going on with your family, what's going on with your economic status, your health, whatever it may be, there should always be the place where we are extremely thankful to God for Jesus Christ. He is valued supremely above everything else, and it doesn't matter what we're going through in life, that never changes. That's how it should be. 
Augustine said it this way, Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. And I think that's a profound statement. Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. So that's my question to you is, do you value Jesus above all else in your life? It's simply that today as we go through this passage. I want you to ask yourself that question. Do you value Jesus above all else in your life? Increasingly today, many professing born-again Christians would have to answer no to this question if polls are correct. Christian Post reporter for Jennifer Riley reports that one in four born-again Christians hold to universalist views of salvation. And 25% of born-again Christians believe that um, all people will eventually be accepted by God apart from faith in Christ. A similar proportion, 26%, said a person religion, person's religion does not matter at all and that all faiths teach the same thing. And 43% of Americans in general believe that it doesn't matter what faith that you hold, they all teach the same lessons. Why is this important? Because the st- statistically, over 80% of Americans claim to be Christians. Ligonier Ministry and Lifeway Research last year did a, 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 a big research uh, questionnaire poll of over 4,000 Americans. It was, a, it, was a, it was done very well to figure out what is the religion of America. About half of Americans believe that there is salvation in Christ alone. Okay, so this means that the other half don't, but up to 80% claim to be Christians. Okay, so it reveals to us uh, a couple of big problems. Um, statistically, this means that about 25% of people here, potentially, could believe that Jesus is not the only way of salvation. That coming in here, you don't affirm what I'm going to preach to you today, that Christ alone is the only means of salvation. That's the statistical reality. I hope it's not true. But that still could be the case, that you could have walked in here with the viewpoint of, the, of many Americans claiming to be Christian, yet affirming that Jesus is not the only way of salvation. So why that, this is why that this sermon is important today. Because what Jesus is going to do is He's going to back every one of you into a corner with His statement that He's going to make today as we read through the text. Uh, The statement, I'll read it again for you. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now the Bible makes abundantly clear that Jesus, that without Jesus, rather, sinners, which we all are, the Bible doesn't discriminate between anyone. It doesn't say there are more sinners, that people sin greater than the other. It puts all of humanity into one group. And the Bible says that apart from Christ, we all have no hope. That's what the Bible teaches. But Jesus here, we'll see, gives us a great cause to be thankful, to value Him above all else in the world because of this. That's what He he says in in this text today and what He does in fulfilling that text. Now, do you believe, again, I'll ask you, do you, do you value Jesus above all in your life? Are you thankful for Jesus above all? Or are there other things in your life taking that place of value that you would, that you would be thankful for above Him or that would take that place of supremacy in your heart? Um, we need to ask ourselves this question. Because I think after we come through this passage, we'll see that that place belongs to Christ and it belongs to Him alone. Now, when we jump in here to the text, you need to know, what is this book we're getting into? This is a gospel. It's a story of Jesus. There are four of them. This one is recorded by John. John was called the beloved disciple of Jesus. He's an eyewitness to the statement that Jesus made right here. He is, uh, he's been with Jesus this whole time. This text that falls into uh, chapter 13 through chapter uh, 17 in your Bible, that's called the farewell discourse. It begins in chapter 13 with Jesus washing his disciples' feet. So we have this intimate picture of Jesus with all of his disciples. He begins to teach them. And it culminates in 17 with Jesus praying for the disciples and for everyone who will believe because of the work that disciples do. That's called Jesus' high priestly prayer. So 13 through 17. And then right here in the middle, the question arises because Jesus tells them, I'm going to be leaving. Peter makes this great statement. He says, I'll follow you anywhere you go. He even says, I'm willing to lay down my life for you. Do you remember that? And then Jesus says, 
you're going to deny me before this night's over three times. He gives this lip service. And then he, Jesus goes into, I am leaving. And then they ask him the questions, where are you going? How can we follow you? And he makes it clear uh, they don't understand completely what he's saying because he's still there with them. The crucifixion hasn't happened, but he's going to prepare a place for them. The work he is doing will reconcile man to God. And he says the statement, 14.1, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, I think, I think many people think Sean Hannity came up with this statement, but he really did it. He, he took it from Jesus. Jesus said it long before him. Let not your hearts be troubled, and they shouldn't be troubled, because Jesus then goes in to explain why in these verses. He is making a way to the Father on our behalf. And then he tells them explicitly the way, which is what we will get into. Jesus made many I am statements. In the book of John, he said, I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the bread of life. I'm the true vine. And here, Jesus' statement that he makes is the most controversial statement, really, in human history. So today, we'll, th- we'll see three facets of the exclusive nature of Jesus and why he should be valued above all else. So these are like three sides of a diamond, if you will. Three facets of Jesus' exclusive nature, his exclusivity, and why he should be valued above all else, or why you should affirm this doctrine of Christ alone. Jesus said again, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So let's jump into our text today. Three facets of Jesus' exclusivity that inform us of why he should be valued above all else in your heart, in my heart and in your heart. So the first, he says it plainly. Look back at your text. Jesus says, I am the way. In John Bunyan's master work, The Pilgrim's Progress, the book begins, this is a great allegory that all Christians should read. He wrote while in prison, being persecuted for his faith. And in prison, he writes this, and and the book starts with a man with a heavy burden on his back. This heavy burden weighs him down. He says he feels that it would take him even lower than the grave. The burden represents his sin. Well, his name is Christian. The man's name is Christian. And Christian, journeying with this heavy load, encounters a man named Evangelist. And so engaging with Evangelist, Evangelist points him where he must go to have his burden removed. And he points him to a wicked gate. And that's how the story begins. He starts off on this journey to the gate, and he reaches the gate goes on. But what he is doing is he is referencing in this little story another statement that Jesus made about the ways or the narrow gate and the broad way. Jesus said in Matthew seven thirteen and 14, enter, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life. And those who find it are few. So two ways. And of course, we know Jesus now will explicitly state that he is that narrow way. He is the way. Stop and think about this for a minute. Think about this statement. Of all of the prophets that have ever lived on the face of the earth, of all of the founders of any religion, of any spiritual guru, they have all said to have to point to a way, to point to a way to engage in religious activity to get you to God. But there has never been, except for Jesus, He is the only one to say and make this claim, I am that way. I am the way. <clears throat> this, gets, get, this gets us right down to the reason that Christians have always been despised in the world and the reasons Christians are despised right now because of this statement of Jesus that I am the way. Everyone would love Christians a lot more if Jesus had made the statement, I am a way. If you could replace the with a, everyone is good to go. But he doesn't do that. He makes an exclusive claim which eliminates everyone else altogether that I am the way. Now, these implications are profound for us to think about. In this statement, Jesus has plainly spoken, and it's impossible for us to misunderstand what he says. You cannot misunderstand what he is saying here. And every person here that hears or reads this must decide if they believe what he's saying. He backs you into a corner with this statement, I am the way. You're right there. He doesn't give you any room to get away. And uh, 
We, it's almost like a fight or a flight response, really, if you think about it. He's forcing you to go one of two directions. I remember once I was doing a... There's not many crawl spaces here in Oklahoma, which is interesting, because they're everywhere in Kansas, but I was doing one remodel job, and I climbed under the crawl space, and I heard some hissing in the corner, and I thought it was a snake at first, so I thought, you know, so I turned around, and it wasn't a snake. It was actually, it was a skunk, so I'm under his crawl space with a skunk, and it was pump, you know, pouncing its feet and hissing, which is good, because it could have sprayed, so I got out pretty quick. But it cho- that's, its fight, that's its fight response. That's a skunk's fight response. Okay, so we know that, and here's what Jesus does. is he, he, makes us, he backs us into a corner like that with this statement, I am the way. Not only us, but everyone else. And it really is this. You either accept it or you reject it. That's, our culture doesn't like that, but that's the reality of what he's saying. He doesn't give us any, any way out. It's either accept or... Or reject. Now, there are several people today in our culture who this is extremely offensive to, obviously. First, there are those of other religions that claim that their way is the way to God. Uh, this is simple for us to understand why this would be offensive to them. Uh, perhaps you yourself know someone or family or friend or people or people that you care about of other religions, and you would know uh, that this would be offensive to them. Jesus has in this statement it just excluded them from access to heaven, access to the Father. He has just said it is impossible for them to know God in any capacity. So highly offensive um, to those that we would know that fall into that category. The Coexist sticker, I don't know if you've seen this or not, it's a bumper sticker, and it spells out with all the symbols of the major world religions the word coexist. This sentiment makes everyone feel warm and fuzzy. But really, the sticker is aimed at Christians. It's not aimed at any other religion but Christianity. Um, <clears throat> and we should coexist here on earth. In fact, the Christian religion teaches you're to love your neighbor, even those of other religions. Even those that would persecute you, you're to love them and pray for them. Um, so we will coexist here on earth, and that's what we teach. But the Bible also teaches we will not coexist for eternity. Only those who come by faith in Jesus Christ will exist together in eternity. Now, second, and predominant view maybe that we encounter today and that you'll encounter out in the world is uh, those that we can call self-justifiers. And this is easy for us to understand, too. A self-justifier is those that believe that they are the way to God and it is their way that they decide for themselves. It is through their own behavior or activity or good work. They are self-justifiers. So the statement of Jesus to be the way directly contradicts what they believe about that there are many ways and that's the way that you decide for yourself and it's your own way and your good works will be good enough to get you into heaven. We've, we hit that the past two weeks, just hammered at home, I believe, that there never will be enough good works. There will never be a way for you to make your own way. This is what the Bible affirms. But this will be the view of your friends and your family that they are good enough, and everyone is pretty much a good person, and therefore, there are many ways. But Jesus affirms that He is only the only way to the Father. Now, we have to understand why, why He is. He is the only way because He is the only one who deals with sin and deals with it through His sacrifice for all time. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us through Him the way He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the Spirit. It's imperative to understand that because of who Jesus is, um, He can only be the only way, being fully God and fully man. Okay, you have to understand, you need a perfect representative the Bible says that we all in our first representative, Adam, have died and fallen into sin. We require another human to be our perfect representative. And this is what Jesus is. He fulfills this for us in our place. He does all of the good works that all of us can't do. He fully meets those requirements. But he also, because he is fully God, is able to make an eternal and God-worthy sacrifice on our behalf. So when he dies for sins, it's a cosmic penalty payment, if you will, because he's fully God and fully man. 
And God justifies us through his death, through the death of Christ. Our culture is shocked by such a claim as Jesus to be the only way to the Father. The disciples would not have been shocked by such an exclusive claim. They were, after all, very used to exclusivity. If you remember, they're from the nation of Israel, who are the only people on earth that have access to God. Um, They believe that not only are they the only people that have access to God, that the temple is the only place where you can worship God. There's another exclusive claim that they have. But not only that, they have a special class of people that are the only ones that can offer sacrifice for the people called priests, another exclusive people. And within, within them, there's the high priest. And only the high priest can do something once a year, and that's begin, go beyond a veil. See, and the temple was divided into diff, different courts. On the outside would be Gentiles, like all of us. We don't have access to the temple courtyard because we're not Jews. Inside that is where the Jews would worship. But inside that is where the priest would do their ministry. But inside that is where God's presence was said to dwell and where he was to dwell physically on the earth. And behind a veil is kept the Ark of the Covenant. And only once a year can the high priest go beyond that veil. So he has direct access to God, the only human alive, and once a year. And something happened on the, on the crucifixion of Jesus that's imperative for us to understand. When Jesus died, the Bible records for us that that veil was torn in half. It was split in two, signifying that access to God was open, that it was wide open for all who would come through Christ and through what he did in our behalf. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says it this way. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, and that would be a reference to beyond the veil, into God's direct presence. It says, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of Israel, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What he is now saying is that all of us that are Christians that would have claimed the doctrine of in Christ alone, that he is the way, that we enter as that priest did into God's very presence, and we should do so boldly. Can you imagine that? If you think of that, that you have direct access into the presence of God. Through Christ, the way to the Father. Extremely incredible just to think about and ponder. Direct access to God through the way. Now, the disciples at the time that he made the statement to be the way, they didn't understand exactly what he was saying because he had not been crucified yet. But later they did, and they unpack it through the rest of the Bible for us, and we see it. But we, when we look now at the Bible, we understand what he's saying, what the truth is behind these words. It is through Jesus that we have direct access to God in this life now, right now, but also in the next life for all eternity. And we have it so because he died as a sacrifice for our sins. And as Christians, if we really believe this truth, our lives ought to have a sense of purpose about it. There ought to be some sense of purpose where to proclaim the truth that Jesus is the only way, not to be ashamed of that truth, that Jesus is the only way, even if it's unpopular, and it is unpopular to our culture. Um, but He is the only way. This has great implications for your friends, your family, your co-workers, who don't believe and don't affirm this truth. Jesus has made it impossible for them to have access to God in this exclusive claim. So with a sense of purpose, we ought to be praying, I think, Fervently praying for those that don't believe this truth. We ought to be t- telling and affirming this truth in a loving manner to, to, to try to persuade, if we can, possibly, people to acknowledge that through Christ is the only way. He is the way. And if you're not a follower of Christ, you have to deal with the claim. You can't do some hokey thing where, uh, you know, I'll, I don't want to deal with this right now, which is what most people do. They come up with all kinds of ways to try to not face the reality of what is said here in the text. If you're not a Christian, he backs you into a corner. You're there. And you either reject what he said or you accept it. And you come to him by faith. Now, the first facet of this diamond is that Jesus is the only way. The second is that Jesus is the truth. The words of Jesus... Um, they're striking to our culture that Jesus would claim he is 
the truth. Postmodernism has completely saturated our culture. Now, postmodernism can be called relativism. This is what it means. What is true for you is true for you. What is true for me is true for me. And they're both equally true. It's actually the easiest worldview to refute because just that claim that there is no truth is a truth claim. And then it then makes the whole thing false. But this is the world we live. You make your claim of truth and I'll make my claim of truth. And, and we all perceive reality our own way. What's true is true for you. It's not for me. And that's okay. But the problem with that is that that is not even logically coherent. Uh, God created a universe of order of truths and falsehoods. And Jesus here makes this great claim about himself that he is the truth. Now, this postmodernist, like, not understanding of truth is really not, it kind of just burst onto the scene in a massive way in culture, but it's really pretty old. In John 18, 37 through 38, Jesus is on trial talking to Pontius Pilate. This is what he says. Pilate says to Jesus, so you are a king. Jesus answered him, you say that I am a king for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Then Pilate says, in a sarcastic, smug nature, what is truth? A very old issue, dilemma that we're facing. Not to believe in real truth. But Jesus says, he is truth. And indeed, he is the way that, gospel, that we come to the gospel by faith. He is the way and the truth. John 1.14 begins this way. This book, if you go to chapter 1, begins with this claim of the truth. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. And we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and of truth. <clears throat> you need to understand that God's, that God's word is always, his word is always a revelation of himself. Now, we talked about this a lot in our membership class, the revelation of God. God has revealed himself in a way to where everyone that is alive on the face of the earth can understand that he exists. They perceive that his power, his divine nature, this is what Romans 1 tells us. But Romans 1 also tells us something about, else about God's initial word is given, this revelation through nature, and that's that we all reject it. Everyone. And this makes us all guilty before God. But God, because He's graceful and gracious and merciful, gives us more revelation. We get more word from God. We get God's word through the prophets. We get God's word through different men recorded in Scripture. But ultimately, in the most great form of His word, His revelation, is in Jesus Christ. R.C. Sproul has said it best, I think, when he said, you don't know anything about another person unless they reveal it to you. You can look at them, try to perceive things, but until they open themselves to relationship and begin to speak to you and reveal things of themselves, you don't know that person really. And if that's true for human-on-human -human interaction, how much more is it true of our interaction with God? How can we know anything about God unless He reveals Himself? And in... Jesus Christ, God, fully reveals Himself to us. And He truly reveals God and who He is. He is the truth of God. God has revealed through His Word. There are many different modes recorded through history of His revelation. But it culminates in the apex of His revelation. And that's Jesus Christ, who is the truth of God, the absolute truth. Jesus makes a profound statement if you go one verse down, if you go to verse 7, where Thomas wants to see the Father. Jesus says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Standing in front of them is God in human flesh. And this is the truth of God revealed for all time in the person, Jesus Christ. It is belief in the truth that saves. Second Thessalonians would tell us that you were saved and sanctified by the Spirit and by belief in the truth. And Jesus is claiming He is truth. He is all truth. But there's yet another meaning of this word that we miss because we are a Greek-minded people. 
the Greco-Roman world, the Western world, has come out of that. Truth is seen as reality versus illusion. So we understand truth in a different way than a Hebrew person understands truth. The Hebrews understand truth in a different way. To them, truth, the word that we translate truth in the Old Testament, is recorded by a different word. And the word it's recorded by is the word faithfulness. Psalm 89.14 tells us that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. In your text, whatever version you may be using, it may actually translate that as steadfast love and truth. But in, in Hebrew, it is best translated steadfast love and faithfulness. So when Jesus says that he is the truth to a Hebrew person, they hear something different. The claim to be the truth of God reveals to them something about the covenant God. Because when that word is used in the Old Testament, it's usually most of the time used about God's faithfulness and his ability to keep his covenant with people. As the covenant keeping, faithful and true, loyal God who's always loyal to his covenants, no matter how many times people break them, he always fulfills what he will do. So to them, the disciples, when they hear this, they have to think of things like this. Um, God made several promises in the Old Testament, and Jesus is now claiming to fulfill them. He's promised in Genesis that that God was going to send someone to crush the serpent's head once and for all. And here he is, the faithfulness of God, standing before them. He promised that he would send a seed of Abraham that would bless all nations. And here's Jesus claiming to be the faithfulness of God, the fulfillment of that. His promise that he made to David that someone would reign on his throne for all eternity. And here's Jesus from the seed of David claiming to be the faithfulness of God. And, of course, we know the suffering servant of Isaiah that was promised to take away the sins of the world. And here he is claiming that for himself to be the faithfulness, the truth of God the covenantly faithful God. And Jesus is claiming in the flesh, stands before the disciples, the truth or the faithfulness of God. All of the Old Testament fulfilled standing before them. And so he says, I am truth, I am faithfulness. The truth claims, these truth claims, it creates in our culture uh, a profound issue, a big issue. See, in our culture, there are many people who claim to be Christians. There are many people that have their own different views of Jesus. And their views, a lot of times, don't match with how he's revealed himself in the Bible. Um, And it may be different from this other person's. But when we see Jesus claim to be truth, we understand that he can only be one truth. And that's who he's revealed himself to be. Perfectly God, standing in the flesh, fully God, fully man, the faithfulness of God, completing all the promises of the Old Testament. Jesus is the truth, and uh, he's the faithfulness of God manifested to us. Now, this should cause us, I think, to be exceedingly grateful, and his, the value that should be in our heart toward him, it should be like, there should be no comparison, because what we have is God fully revealed. And, and when we know him, we know him not because we're smarter, as we saw last week in Grace Alone, but because he has drawn us to himself, and he saved us not because of our works, and he... Oh, this old relationship that we have with him, any understanding that we have, was brought about by his work. In 1 John 5.20 we read, And we know that the Son of God has come and, and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So the second facet is that Jesus is the truth. So the first, he is the way. Second, he is the truth. Now we come to the last, that Jesus is the life. If you look back at your text, he claims that he's the life. Now imagine you're the disciples living in this. You've followed Jesus around for years. You've listened to his sermons. You've seen him do miracles. You've walked all of the dirty, dusty roads. You've seen him touch people that no one on earth at that time would touch. You've seen him talk with women Uh, which goes against the culture of the time, and you've seen him make claims that no one else has ever made. Um, He makes here this claim that he is the life, and then he gets crucified, and he's dead, and he's put into a tomb. Can you imagine that happening? 
He's made all of these claims. He claims to be the life, but how can he be the life and, but when he's dead? And how can a dead man then bring you to God? In John 10.10, 10, he claims that he will give us life and give it abundantly. But how can he give us abundant life when he's just been crucified? He's gone. John 11.25, he says he's the resurrection and the life. But how can he be the resurrection when he's not resurrected? This must have been all of the things going through the disciples' heads when they were scattered. And Paul knows the implications of Jesus and him not being resurrected. When he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 19, he'll say, the resurrection of Jesus is so important to our understanding of Christianity, who we are, that if Jesus was not resurrected from the dead, then we are still dead in our sins, without hope in the world, and we are fools to be pitied among all people of the earth. But he, then he goes on to say, But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, because by one man came death, and by one man has come the resurrection of the dead in life. And Adam all die, in Christ all live. The resurrection changed everything for the disciples. When Jesus rose again, He secured an everlasting life for all those that trust in Him. By faith, His resurrection was not like the resurrection of, let's say, Lazarus, as He rose Lazarus from the dead, because one day, Lazarus died again. But when Jesus rose from the grave, He rose to everlasting life. And that is the everlasting type of life that He promises those who come to Him by faith. And because Jesus lives, now... We have direct access to God now. We have abundant life now. And we have hope that one day that we too, even after we die, we are going to live. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you have to understand that um, there is no hope of eternal life in this universe. One day, your life is going to end. One day, your life will be over. But in Christ, there is hope for everlasting life, for eternal life, that we can live forever because of what He's done. And you have to deal with this fact of the empty tomb if you're not a Christian. You have to understand and deal with this fact. There was an historical man named Jesus. There is more historical evidence for him than for Alexander the Great, which is taught as historical fact in school. Jesus lived He was a real person. Jesus died. Another historical fact, he was crucified. Third historical fact, Jesus was put into a grave under watch of Roman guards. All historical facts. Last fact, the tomb was empty three days later. Now you have to reconcile to yourself the best explanation for that tomb being empty. There is no Logical and good explanation for how Roman guards can fail in their duty to protect a tomb. The most elite soldiers of their day. Jesus is who he claimed to be. It's the resurrection and the life. He gives abundant life. Everyone who comes to him, though they die, they will live. Jesus is God fully revealed in the flesh. and He was resurrected to show he is who he says he is. 1 John 5.12 says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So this is now the third facet. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. And when we see Him in this way, in this exclusive claim, the most controversial claim ever made by any person to ever live, we see that it is in Christ and Christ alone that we have confidence to come before God. And then we see that He should be valued above all else in our life. Nothing should come close in comparison. Augustine said, I'll say it again, he said, Jesus Christ is not valued at all until He is valued above all. You think about that statement. How do we know if we value Christ above all? It's a good question, I think. Maybe you're asking. I think it simply comes down to what you do with your life. And if you simply are doing what He said... He always would go and he would say to people, come and follow me. That's a simple statement to make, but it's very hard to do. Because often in Jesus' day, that means you're following him to death. If you go back to Peter's story, you remember what happened with Peter? 
Before Jesus was arrested, he said, I'll follow you anywhere, even to the death. And then Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times. So he's just giving lip service at that point. So I wonder often, is that what Christianity is today? Is it just lip service to God? Is that, is that what we say? We affirm these truth claims, but are we just giving lip service like Peter? <clears throat> Something happened to Peter. And if you know the rest of the story as it plays out, Peter ran off. He abandoned him. And he went back to doing what he knew to do. He went back to becoming a fisherman. And then you encounter Jesus um, confronting, really, Peter when he's fishing. And the, and the conversation goes. If you turn over to the end of John, you can see how it plays out. Peter says he loves him. He'd do anything for him. And three different times, if you love me, Peter, do you love me? He says it three times, right? Because Jesus, he was denied three times. He denied Jesus three times. So maybe this even doesn't match your view of Jesus. Look at how cruel of Jesus to ask him a question three times to reiterate the fact that he had um, denied him three times. But yet, that's what he does. If you love me, feed my sheep. And then I want you to see what he says to Peter, to Peter. What Peter needs to do. It's very simple but profound. Verse 19. <clears throat> and after saying this, he said to him, follow me. That's it. Follow me. And we know that Peter would follow him. That person that ran scared now would just in a, in a few months is going to preach the most powerful sermon maybe ever preached and 2,000 people become Christians. He then goes on and we know from church history that he's willing to die for Jesus. And in fact, he does die for Jesus. But then the writer of this book also asks Jesus about Peter and what he's going to do. And what does Jesus say to John, the one who wrote this letter? Look at your text again. It says, Peter's turned and saw the disciple who Jesus loved following. One who also had leaned back against him during the supper. And he said, Lord, who is, that going, who, is, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? So he's asking, you want me to follow you? What about John? Is he going to follow you to lay down his life too? What about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? So what he's saying, what I have for John to do, what is that to you? I told you to follow me, right? And then he says it again, you follow me. That's what he says. And that is what I think it means when we are valuing Jesus above all else in our hearts. When we have come to that place where we understand that it's through Christ alone, we just follow him. That's it. Faithfully following Jesus. And that looks different for everyone here because God has given you different tools. He's equipped you in different ways. He's placed you providentially in certain people's paths. And you just have to be faithful to follow Him. And when you are, that's when you are valuing Christ above all else in your heart. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, and this claim does it, you're backed into the corner. You're like a wild animal backed into a corner. You're going to run, you're going to fight. But Jesus does this, and He has placed you in this place on purpose whether you either accept him for who he is or you outright reject him. There's no middle ground. I've seen all kinds of crazy things happen when I begin sharing the gospel with people. The craziest probably was I walked all the way through all of this man's argumentations against Christianity, and he admitted they were all wrong. He believed what I was saying, and we got down to this truth statement of Jesus. And here's what he said, so he didn't have to believe it. He said, but you don't know if Jesus is an alien. I was like, man... We just went through all of this stuff, and that is all you got. That's all you come up with. I knew it's over then. It's over. He will come up with anything in his mind to reject it. You don't know if Jesus is an alien. C.S. Lewis has said it best, I think, in his book, In Mere Christianity. This is what he said. I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. But I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who said, he's, that's what we shouldn't say about Jesus. This is C.S. Lewis now. A man who said this sort of things, Jesus said, would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level 
with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, you have just heard the truth of what he claimed about himself. And now you have to decide, receive him as Lord and fall at his feet and worship him as God or reject him outright. It would be my prayer and hope that you would surrender your life to Christ as the Lord of your life, that you would value him above all else. Peter said it this way. We'll close with his words. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's pray.